three. All righty, guys. We are in store for a wonderful, wonderful show today. Uh, it's been quite some time since we've had the Colonel back. Uh, it's uh, I, I've been wanting to for so long. He's been busy. And of course, as you all know, we've been busy on the show. And uh, needless to say, we've got him back and we're going to have a heck of a show today uh, from him. Uh, but first off, I'd like to go ahead and let you all know if y'all don't know, uh, the book will be listed in the show notes. Uh, this is Colonel Walkoff's currently released book. And it is, as you can see, tact tactics, techniques, procedures for special operations forces. And uh, there are SOG mission stories, uh, not many names. Uh, some names do come up, but these are all missions while he was at CCC that he refers to. And it is one of the if not the greatest uh, tactics books in uh, in print right now, and he's trying to get it to where some of the group, uh, some of the special forces groups, and even Marsoc can start reading this and use. Um, it's even got a great write up by Ken Bowray in the back, mentioning uh, Colonel Walkoff, seven years uh, in special forces, and was uh, one of the best one zeros with 25 missions behind enemy lines. Uh, so get this book. You will not regret it. And to, uh, to take her, take care of some house cleaning that I've got before I hand it over to the good Colonel. Uh, we've got, uh, I, I want to let Jason know, Jason, I've got a, uh, a book for you, Sogcom tomb, and I have you a Lancer 101st, uh, CCN air support uh, with the Project Delta and CCN logo challenge coin that I will be getting out to you. And um, I just wanted to let Major Alex know that I have gotten his flag. And this flag, uh, sorry for the, the short notice thing, but this flag was actually flown. Um, and it's the uh, American flag, of course. Um, was flown on um, certificate of authenticity. The flag was flown in honor of Bud Gibson, um, aircraft commander Timothy Alex, Major Timothy Alex, U.S. Air Force, Captain Patrick Retzer, and Alexander Roth, Staff Sergeant, uh, the boom operator, um, was flag, uh, was flown on board a KC-135 Strato tanker on September 11th uh, 2023 over Iraq during a combat mission in support of Operation Inherit Resolve. Let all who look upon this flag be reminded of the military men and women who maintain a steadfast devotion to protecting the freedoms that it represents. So I uh, want to thank all of the men who uh, sent them, especially the major. I thank y'all very much, and it will be soon be put up. Uh, here behind us so everyone can see it uh, every day. But I had to thank you for that. And one last piece. Um, I was uh, gifted, maybe Colonel Walkoff can help me out, but I was gifted a what I believe to be a CISO back, CISO backpack um, from an RT Nevada 1-1. Um, he sent this to me. Um, it's sterile, no markings. He's, of course, added a updated slip on it, but um, he sent this to me, um, and I've yet to thank him, Mr. Larry Briggs of RT Nevada, CCC 1968-69. So thank you, Mr. Larry, if you watch this. Um, thank you. Uh, and without further ado, I'm sorry for the house cleaning, but I needed to do that. Um, Take it away, Mr. Ed. Uh, hi. Uh, Bud and I have, have discussed kind of like a uh, an agenda here to talk about. I mean, to lead off in the agenda is to talk about how I found out about SOG. So uh, out of high school, I went to uh, Temple University and... Uh, uh, was enrolled in an ROTC class, uh, which was the ROTC Ranger Company for uh, Temple University. 
uh, and we had some special forces advisors and uh, uh, they took uh, a number of us, just a few of us under their wing and uh, uh, tried to influence us, uh, you know, to go into special forces. Uh, and during the course of uh, my uh, affiliation with them, they would often speak about SOG in whispers. And we would overhear and we would were curious and wanted to know what was SOG, what were they talking about? Uh, and they basically said, we can't tell you, uh, it's classified. Uh, but during the course of overhearing their conversations, uh, we discovered that they had, at that point in time, uh, about a 70% uh, casualty rate, which uh, kind of uh, made us all enthusiastic. Uh, and uh, I was the first uh, among my peers there in the uh, ranger company to drop out of college and uh, enlist uh, in the army with the intent of going into special forces and ultimately uh, finding my way uh, to SOG. Uh, I got to brag and we we're going through training group. Uh, Colonel Walkoff, I hate to interrupt, but did, didn't you actually have some famous um, SOG men or future SOG men in your class with you at yeah, I said I was the first to drop out. I was followed by uh, others, uh, notably uh, Carl Frank Wett, who went to CCS initially, and then he was subsequently assigned to uh, CCC. Uh, and, and then Skip Strohlein, uh, who uh, uh, was assigned to CCN, and subsequently got killed on a halo operation uh, in uh, North, uh, central Laos. Uh, and uh, there was another guy who went into special forces at the same time that Strohline did, but he, uh, he declined to go to Vietnam and he became an instructor. He was a medic. So there were several of us who dropped out with the ambition of getting into special forces and three of us with the ambition about getting into SOG. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, in training group, uh, we had uh, the occasion to uh, do some parachute uh, jumping to stay current uh, with our parachute qualification. That was basically every three months or so. And on one of those occasions, uh, we went to the, the green ramp at Pope Air Force Base, which was where uh, parachutists would assemble prior to boarding uh, for airdrops uh, at, the, at one of the Fort Bragg's uh, uh, drop zones. And we saw, uh, out in the parking area, uh, a C-130 Blackbird uh, that had distinct coloration. It had the scissors uh, appendage uh, on the front of the aircraft for snatching uh, people off the ground. Uh, and uh, it looked very menacing and uh, one of my fellow, uh, one of the fellow, uh, I think it might have even been John Plaster, uh, who uh, acknowledged that it was uh, the aircraft that supported SOG. Uh, and we got into a discussion very briefly. Uh, and he, he also echoed that SOG at that point had 70% uh, casualty rate. As it turns out, uh, that 70% casualty rate was 
on the on the low side. That might have been the casualty rate in 1967 or 68, but in 69 and 70, uh, it had ascended to 100%. Just in passing, I wanted to pass that along. Uh, so uh, here I was at uh, at fifth group, uh, waiting for uh, transportation to Contum, where FOV2 was located. Uh, and the aircraft was loaded with uh, pallets uh, for supply of uh, the uh, CCC operation. Uh, and we were basically sitting on top of the pallets or laying on top of the pallets, flying from the Trang, which is where the Special Forces Group was located, to Contum uh, Airfield. And uh, as, as we arrived at that airfield, uh, a uh, tractor trailer rig pulled up uh, and uh, from FOB2. Uh, and uh, they loaded the pallets from the aircraft onto the, onto the truck. And then we piled onto the back of the, uh, uh, you know, onto the trailer onto the pallets that were mounted on the trailer for the trip to the FOB, which was about maybe three miles away from the airfield. Right adjacent to uh, the airfield was the province headquarters. Uh, in passing, I should say that not only was it the, uh, the province, provincial headquarters, which was located in the same compound with uh, the... Uh, Phoenix program uh, and the uh, uh, prisoner compound where the prisoners were interrogated. Uh, so we, we left uh, the airfield, turned onto the road that was between the road and the provincial headquarters and drove to the front, uh, you know, drove uh, towards the front of where the provincial headquarters entrance was and in front of the provincial uh, headquarters was uh, a, uh, a vacant field. And right in the middle of that vacant field was a French Panhard armored car, which was, had been destroyed from the uh, French Indochina War, which is, it, it kind of brought home to me the... Uh, the fact that uh, we weren't the uh, the first uh, organization to uh, to deal with the uh, the North Vietnamese or the Vietnamese communists, uh, and it also, yeah, in due course, uh, we kind of met a similar fate to the French. Uh, so it was, it was kind of. Uh, a prognostication or the the uh, projection uh, of what was to come. Uh, we uh, it was uh, very interesting on my first trip from the airfield to the FOB compound to see uh, you know the the environment uh, that I was going to be living in for the next couple of years. A lot of the buildings were of uh, French provincial architecture. It was stucco with uh, red or orange uh, tile roofs, uh, very quaint. Uh, and you look at it from uh, above, from an aircraft, and it's you know uh, very beautiful to, to look upon. The closer you got, though, the uh, less attractive it was because uh, at that point in time, uh, Vietnam was, uh, I will say, an armpit uh, of a place. Uh, there was no sanitation. There was no sewers. There, you know, elect electricity was a sometime thing. Uh, and uh, by comparison to our, you know, American standards, it was kind of primitive. Uh, and uh, then we drove up to the uh, to the FOB compound. Now, 
it, it turns out that FOB2 had uh, acquired uh, a, a compound that had previously been belonged to the Vietnamese military uh, and was uh, not needed by them. And the compound was actually divided into two segments, one on each side of the highway. Uh, and uh, which I felt was kind of like intuitively wrong uh, because, uh, it, you know, it wasn't optimum for, there it is, uh, it wasn't optimum for uh, uh, perimeter defense. So what you're seeing here on the right-hand side of this photo is the uh, uh, the operational side, if you will, and then on the left-hand side, and the background was the uh, mess hall and the club and the theater, uh, and uh, right across from the entrance uh, to that was the uh, the uh, the clinic, the medical clinic, uh, and then there were other uh, quarters there for uh, Covey riders. There were forward air uh, observers, and uh, and then other. There was also some uh, space set aside for security company that we had. So security company was consisted of Vietnamese troops uh, or not troops, actually, they were, uh, you know, hires. They were responsible for perimeter security uh, and access control. As you come into the, uh, the tactical side uh, of the compound, right above that large building, right next to the road, there, that it was the S4, uh, that was the supply uh, facility. Right next to that, to the there, uh, was the communication shed. Uh, and then uh, below that, right there, that small building right below the S4 shop, uh, was uh, the photo lab. And then that longer building there, where, where the hand is currently pointing, was the latrine that, that served the, uh, the American uh, recon teams. The cluster of buildings uh, to the right of that were, and this is an old photo, so there was actually a, another building there uh, were set aside for uh, American and uh, recon teams, American-led recon teams, uh, and then the the build the building that was to uh, ultimately uh, be closer towards the latrine was the, for the Vietnamese recon teams. That is to say the Vietnamese soldiers who were Vietnamese airborne rangers. Uh, to the right of those buildings there uh, were the, where the Vietnamese uh, indigenous team members were, and they were pretty lousy troops. Uh, they were uh, Soldiers, uh, they weren't soldiers, they were, uh, uh, they were criminals from Saigon who were offered an opportunity to serve their country rather than go to prison. Uh, and uh, uh, I can tell you a lot of stories about them, uh, but uh, the Vietnamese team leadership who were Vietnamese Rangers, they were horrible. And the people who uh, uh, who were the indigenous members of, you know, the non-military uh, indigenous troops housed in that building there 
they were up, they were criminals and absolutely horrible. You know, uh, to the right of that, uh, there is a, uh, that was the motor pool. Uh, and that subsequently got increased in size, uh, with the exception of one Jeep and one, uh, ton of, you know, five quarter truck, everything that you see there and much, much more later on were all, all vehicles that we stole from various units in Pleiku and uh, elsewhere. Uh, we had uh, forklifts, a deuce and a half trucks, five ton trucks, tractor trailer rigs, uh, uh, a whole fleet of Jeeps that we had stolen uh, because we weren't, we weren't authorized them on our uh, table of organization and equipment. Uh, that long building that you see there, uh, that was, uh, it was an indigenous mess was part of that. Uh, and then there were some uh, other quarters set aside for uh, the people who uh, provided uh, maintenance and vehicular support. The long building you see uh, up towards the top, laterally. No. There. Uh, the, the leftmost portion of that, perhaps three quarters of that, that was a company, that was an exploitation uh, force, uh, company size op. And then uh, the remaining th one third of it were uh, mountain yard uh, indigenous uh, team member. Uh, so uh, that was basically the layout. And you see to the right there, that is the, uh, that was the helipad that we had. You see parked there uh, to you, uh, CH-34 helicopters which were you know, fabulous uh, helicopters, very rugged. Uh, and uh, uh, they were piloted by very brave uh, Vietnamese pilots, totally unlike the Vietnamese Rangers uh, who they supported. You'll see ringed around uh, the perimeter uh, were, was a bunker line. Uh, and uh, the bunker line was Yeah. Every team uh, and uh, and the company had assigned uh, positions. Uh, they had a set of uh, bunkers that uh, they had to maintain, uh, and they manned them. Uh, uh, they posted uh, teams when the teams were in their duty cycle uh, to man those uh, once or twice a week during the duty cycle. Uh, and uh, they were certainly the positions where, you know, if we got attacked, that, that's where we reported to to defend the perimeter. Uh, on the corners, you will see uh, concrete bunkers that were manned by the uh, Vietnamese security force I mentioned earlier. So that's basically the layout uh, of the, uh, of the comment. I that comment I just saw, that's uh, Mr. Terry. He was uh, with the Hatchet Forces while uh, I think right as you got there, I think you uh, he, he de-roast uh, as you started taking New York over. But he's, uh, he's a CC vet with us viewing today. So his comment about raising of the FOB2, uh, I, I assume he's talking about that that occurred. Uh, after, after we left, mm -hmm. uh, if you take a look, oh. uh, at, uh, you know, Google maps, you will see enormous changes to the, uh, to the area. 
and uh, FOB for Denang is now a beach resort. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Enormous changes have, have occurred. Uh, so it, you know, it's it's not even recognizable. Uh, the airstrip that we used for the launch site, which was a dock tow, um, that's no longer it's no longer there. I believe uh, that whole area has been built up, uh, and uh, the area where we used to operate, uh, and uh, you know, all along the border has been changed dramatically from uh, mining activity and uh, forest harvesting. So it's a lot, largely uh, a lot of the rainforest that used to exist there has been stripped. Uh, at least some of it has anyway. Uh, anyway, uh, so upon arrival uh, at FOB2, we drove into the compound and uh, walking towards the, uh, the mess hall, uh, was a friend of mine from, uh, our time in training group. And his name is John St. Martin. And, uh, he had arrived, uh, uh, just a little bit earlier than I had, maybe a month or so. Uh, and, uh, he recognized me instantly. And uh, it turns out that uh, the team that he was on was Recon Team New York. And uh, it turns out that Recon Team New York was kind of like a hard luck team. Uh, they had gotten uh, shot up on a number of uh, occasions. And that's John St. Martin right there. You can see he's a very robust build uh, and uh, had powerful musculature uh, and a, a real warrior, uh, John was. Uh, and uh, uh, so he insisted that, uh, you know, I come to RT New York. Uh, but what had just happened was RT New York had come back from an operation and they had got, Near one zero, who was a lieutenant, uh, who's I think his name was Raponte, mm -hmm. had gotten killed, uh, and uh, the one one, which was the assistant team leader, uh, had uh, had gotten severely wounded in medevac. So the one two was. Uh, assigned to be the team leader for our team New York. And uh, his merit apparently was the fact that he was, he had combat experience with the 173rd and had been in recon with the 173rd. Uh, it turns out that he had gotten in special forces through the back door, which means that Special Forces uh, had a lot of vacancies in Vietnam uh, due to casualties. Uh, so they they started a practice of if you were a, a staff sergeant with combat experience uh, in uh, you know a combat unit uh, and wanted to join Special Forces, they would automatically give you a beret and say, you know, you're in, wow. uh, and, and uh, they would do, wouldn't have to go through training group and they got their special forces qualification uh, back door, as I say. And uh, so they never went through a selection process. They never went through special forces training. Uh, the only merit that they brought to the table was prior experience in a combat unit. Kinnear was one of those guys. Uh, and, uh, uh, he, he turned out to be an absolutely uh, terrible team leader. Uh, we received very little training at his hands. Uh, he uh, didn't treat the Montagnards very well. Very arrogant guy. 
uh, and uh, he had some other problems that I won't even mention. Mm -hmm. And the uh, so I met him, and St. Martin said, uh, "We have a vacancy. This is Ed Wolkoff, friend of mine. He can be the one two, fill out the team." Kinnear said, "Okay." He really didn't care. He kind of looked me up and down. I said, "Okay." So uh, uh, John took me over uh, to the company headquarters. Uh, and as we were uh, walking over there, uh, the uh, there was a guy who had just come in on the helipad who was dressed in black fatigues. He was a diminutive guy, very small, totally bald head. His name was Carlos Parker. And he had just come back from an operation where his team had been surrounded on a hilltop. Uh, and it took all day for uh, employing TAC air in order to get him extracted. He and his team extracted. It was kind of a dramatic introduction for me. And as we were heading towards the recon company uh, headquarters, uh, John St. Martin was explaining what, what had occurred with uh, Carlos Parker's team. Uh, when we got to the uh, headquarters building, which I failed to point out in that uh, overhead shot of the compound, uh, there was uh, Sergeant First Class Bob Howard, who was the, um, I guess he was either the ops sergeant or possibly the first sergeant at that point. Uh, and uh, St. Martin had explained to me that he had been nominated for the Medal of Honor on three occasions. And uh, on two of those occasions, uh, the uh, recommendation had been downgraded. Uh, but he was awaiting word there's a, there's the photo of him, a waiting word for the third recommendation for the for the award, uh, and uh, he wasn't really allowed to go to the field anymore because he was pending a Medal of Honor award. So they tended to restrict you from. They didn't want their Medal of Honor recipients killed, I guess, before they had an opportunity to showcase them. Uh, so that was my initial uh, introduction. Uh, I brought my uh, duffel bag over to uh, the uh, to the team room, and uh, wasn't uh, but a day or so after that, after I was introduced to the mountain yards, uh, that uh, Kinnear was summoned over to the uh, to the recon company uh, headquarters building to receive a warning order and the warning order was that the, the team was to go to uh to doc toe uh, to be the bright light team uh, which to explain the bright light team was responsible for uh manning uh the uh the launch site and keeping it secure and maintaining it but they were also there as a rescue party for down air crewmen uh, or uh, uh, rescue and recovery of uh, reconnaissance teams uh, in our area of operations. Uh, so that was the first uh, assignment. What I did not know was that I was supposed to be I was supposed to go to uh, the one zero course at long time, which was uh, a uh, kind of an introduction to uh, jungle warfare for uh, SOG recon and uh, exploitation force uh, Americans. Uh, long time taught other courses, but the one zero course was kind of like 
the qualifier uh, you, you're supposed to go through before you were assigned, uh, before you were allowed to go uh, on missions. Well, for some reason, they forgot about me. And I never went to uh, the one zero course at long time and instead learned OJT on the job training, uh, which I think turned out to be a blessing because the, uh, the course at Long Ton only taught reconnaissance basics. Uh, and the, the real training would come at the hands of an experienced multi-tour one zero uh, team leader. Uh, and uh, Kinnear was not a multi-tour a multi-tour experience one zero. He was uh, incompetent in many respects. So uh, I learned the hard way. Uh, John St. Martin, I think maybe had uh, one mission. Uh, he had gone to one zero course and he had one mission. Uh, the across the fence, I believe, before he had been assigned or reassigned to uh, RT New York. Could be wrong in that. Uh, but uh, he, he scarcely had any more experience than I did. So RT New York, at the time that I got there, had a, a, uh, a very poor team leader and two inexperienced other Americans, you know, St. Martin, the one one assistant team leader, and me, the one two, uh, the radio, the radio man. Uh, it was during this bright light assignment, which was a week long, that uh, uh, we did really discovered some of the problems that uh, uh, Kinnear had, uh, and uh, when we got back from the bright light assignment, uh, Kinnear immediately took off to go to Okinawa on leave. Uh, and John St. Martin and I decided uh, that we would go and, and talk about what we had observed in terms of Kinnear's behavior and basically asking for us to go to other teams uh, if that was possible, because we didn't want to want run recon under Kinnear. Uh, and we told him what we had told Bob Howard what we did, had observed, and Bob Howard basically said, okay. So St. Martin did the initial talking, and I was confirmatory. We had observed the same thing. The Montyards weren't comfortable with Kinnear. So Bob Howard said, let me handle it. And Kinnear did not come back. He stayed at o Okinawa. I found out later while I was on an extended leave, a reenlistment leave, that he had come back. He had volunteered to come back again. And as soon as people found out that it was the same Kinnear who had been assigned to RT New York, they sent him away again uh, because he was that bad. Uh, so, uh, with Kinnear gone, then the next guy in line for the team leader position was John St. Martin. John St. Martin only had two missions under his belt, and I had none other than the bright light. We really didn't depart on any ops, uh, any bright light missions. We were... Uh, fortunately, no teams got into uh, such a situation that required us, our assistance. So, uh, St. Martin was was uh, told by the then company commander, whose name was Captain Stanton, that he would be uh, he would take the team out on uh, the next mission. But that he would be assigned as the team leader only on a temporary basis. 
Uh, and we were told that there was a new arrival on the, uh, uh, on the compound uh, who would be replacing uh, St. Martin after this particular mission. Uh, and uh, this guy's name was uh, Mike Potter. And he was also came to special forces through the back door. He was also a guy from the 173rd Airborne. Uh, and uh, he was, if anything, he was even worse than, uh, than Kinnear. Uh, I mean, they both had their negatives. The negatives were different. Uh, so uh, Potter was uh, really didn't like uh, St. Martin or myself. Uh, and he uh, disliked, he didn't uh, have a very fond regard for the Montagnards either on our team. They disliked him equally. Uh, and uh, Potter did not train the team, uh, except for we go out on the helipad and do dry run immediate action drills or battle drills, which would take about an hour or so. And as soon as that would done, he would go off to the club and start drinking. Uh, and uh, on some very few other occasions, we would go to the range to do some live fire, but we didn't even do live fire battle drills at the range. We would just go and shoot our weapons. That was it. And we'd go back to the compound, we'd clean our weapons, and he would go to the club and drink. So, uh, he was assigned, uh, Mike Potter uh, was on that uh, initial mission where St. Martin was the temporary uh, team leader and Captain Stanton accompanied as a strap hanger. Uh, and uh, that operation turned into a real fiasco. Now, I, the mission was located in an area called Hotel Nine. Uh, and Hotel Nine was a uh, uh, a uh, bad. It was a it was a hot target. Uh, it was located uh, very near to uh, an enemy base area, uh, and just down the road a piece from another base area. So there was a high concentration of enemy. There's Hotel Nine. You can see. And uh, to the lower right, there you go. Uh, and you can see it was fairly rugged. Uh, and uh, I'll just describe very briefly uh, what happened. So St. Martin and I uh, decided that we wouldn't, because you know, the temperatures were outrageously hot and outrageously humid. So we decided that we would kind of strip down our gear and we would split a poncho liner to sleep in. And as soon as we, we arrived in uh, Hotel 9, the temperature dropped dramatically, uncharacteristically in rainforest. Uh, freezing rain, hail, and that kept up for uh, two days. Uh, the first night on the ground, I had never been so cold in my life. I was literally, my, my teeth were literally chattering. Uh, and uh, uh, it St. Martin was in the same situation. 
So we wound up, St. Martin and I wound up sleeping together, snuggling up to, to share body warmth. The following day, we uh, got up and we headed up uh, the ridge line you see to the west uh, and ascended uh, a ridge uh, and then took a pause for uh, the afternoon communication break. Uh, we were near the top of the ridge and uh, we put out claymores. And it was my, and St. Martin came to me and he said, here's our location. Here's the situation report. It was my duty to, to encrypt his message and then transmit it. We were outside the range, a communication range with the regular antenna. So I had to erect uh, the long antenna in order to contact the communication relay site uh, that we had uh, in uh, southeastern Laos, which is called Leghorn. Uh, I learned a lot from the mistakes that I made during that operation. So the first mistake that I made was I took off my rucksack and removed the existing antenna and installed the long antenna before I sat down with the uh, en encryption pad and the message that John wanted me to send. I started to encrypt and then all of a sudden all hell broke loose. One of the Montagnards set off a claymore. It turns out that at the at the top of this ridge, we were just a, you know about a dozen meters away from the top of the ridge. Unknown to us was a high speed trail. And coming along the high speed trail, uh, walking south uh, towards Cambodia was a platoon of NBA. Uh, and uh, the Montagnard who set off the, uh, uh, the Claymore did so without warning anybody. And I had only partly in encrypted the message, didn't even get a chance to, to send it. I, uh, so there I was kind of in a panic about, I had uh, the, the one-time pad encryption booklet in one hand, the, the message in my other hand, and my, my uh, antenna up uh, and, uh, and a firefight starting out. Some other interesting things happened where the Montagnard who set off the Claymore just ran away. He ran downhill, you know, abandoned his post, didn't, re didn't attempt to bring the enemy under fire. Along with him was another Montagnard who also abandoned his post and ran away. Somewhere along the line, an enemy round struck a smoke grenade that was on the belt of uh, one, one of the Montagnards. And the, uh, a huge purple cloud started to emit behind this guy running away, running through the jungle, heading towards uh, uh, an LZ, which is kind of funny. So that was a lesson that I learned, uh, was that you always do a perimeter search to make sure that there's no high-speed trails on the other side of a bush. The other thing I learned was do not erect a long antenna until you're ready to transmit. Because what happened then was I tucked away uh, this paperwork into my uniform, uh, picked up the rucksack that had the uh, radio in it, and started backing down the hill. I tripped over a vine, fell backwards down the ridge, 
the radio came out of my rucksack. The if you if anybody is familiar with uh, a long antenna, it's a segmented antenna, which the segments are attached by uh, a line. So during the course of me falling down the ridge, the antenna wrapped around uh, some uh, bushes and vegetation. Uh, and John St. Martin comes up to try and recover the radio and he kicks it down the slope, which then breaks off the uh, long antenna at the base of the radio. So we had no commo except by emergency radio. Uh, everybody else was heading down, down the slope towards the LZ, except the point, uh, the uh, tail gunner, uh, John St. Martin and myself. So the radio was useless. I decided why carry a useless radio? The handset had also ripped off the radio. So I, we had absolutely had no combo from that, from that radio at all. It was a prick 25. So I, I took this, uh, uh, XM 15 car 15 predecessor and put some rounds into the radio and just left it. And we headed back and I started having trouble with the, uh, with this uh, experimental car 15. Uh, and uh, it was just, uh, it was just a mess. I tried firing it on the LZ. It would fire two rounds and then stop. I do, you know, I correct the malfunction. It would fire another round or two. <laughs> so I kind of uh, had uh, some real concerns about uh, the car 15. Now this was a hand-me-down from John St. Martin. John St. Martin, when I arrived, gave me his, that experimental weapon. And then he actually got, uh, at that point, the car 15s were just coming into theater and John St. Martin, only the team leaders were getting the car 15s initially. So he got a car 15. I got this piece of shit. Uh, and, uh, I fell out of, you know, I, I wasn't too comfortable with car 15s thereafter. Uh, I will mention that I had other problems with, you know, after I received my own car 15, I had problems with that as well. It turns out that the car 15 has some problems, but most of the problems were rooted in uh, the ammunition. It was, it was uh, you know, the 5.56 five, millimeter round at that point was... Uh, uh, was causing a lot of malfunctions. So, uh, <sighs> yep. No, that is actually after I, I received the car 15. So at that point, John had a car 15. I had a car 15. Uh, you can tell because it, uh, because it had the bolt assist. So the, the, the original weapon that I had had no bolt assist on it. Oh. Wow. So you got, you got, ended up getting rid of it shortly after. Yeah, that. I got rid of it, turned that sucker in, got a car 15 of my own. Uh, but I was still having stoppages or malfunctions. Uh, wow. So the guy who stayed with me, go back to that, if you will. Okay, my bad. Sorry about that. So um, the guy that stayed with me, the Monier that stayed with me, was the guy who was crouching at, at my feet. His name was Ga, H-G-A. One of the guys who ran was the guy to the far left, 
who had the M16 there. His name was Ta. Uh, but he was not the initial guy that ran. The guy who initially ran was fired when we got back uh, to the FOB. Oof. Uh, and he was the guy who had the uh, smoke grenade attached to his belt, streaming smoke behind him. It was, it was ludicrous. So, uh, learned a lot of a lot of things the hard way, the hard way uh, on uh, on that first op. Uh, subsequently, uh, Mike Potter took over the team. And I mentioned uh, some of his uh, the problems we had with him. So the second mission that we had, this one under Mike Potter, uh, was uh, to. Uh, a target area called Oscar three. And it was, it was a very easy operation. All we had to do was to get off the helicopter uh, and find a place to hide uh, an RF beacon that was to be used to guide B-52 strikes. And then call in the helicopter and get extracted. It was a one day op at max. Uh, and Potter was extremely nervous. And uh, as, as we approached the LZ, one of our monyards spotted an enemy bunker, open fire. So we got up and we went to an alternate LZ, landed, but didn't land, actually uh, hovered about uh, three to five meters above the ground. I was standing out on the helicopter strut and slipped. And I dropped to the ground and, and Potter followed me. And he just ripped me a new asshole because uh, I had gotten off the aircraft before he did. Well, I didn't even bother arguing with him, you know, about, you know, it was accidental. Uh, but uh, he was very nervous uh, about the operation. And Oscar III was just above uh, the uh, Hotel 9, which you saw on your map. Uh, it wasn't depicted on that map, but it was in that vicinity. And that, that whole area had been, had received numerous B-52 strikes. So, uh, Juliet 9 was overlapped with Oscar 3, Oscar 3, uh, a little to the right. And it was a very hot area. And we kept on uh, bombing it with B-52, and the following day, the road was reestablished. The road does not show up there. Uh, this map was, uh, I don't know what year that map was, but it, well, I'll talk about the problem that we had with maps a little later on. Uh, so Oscar three. All these, all these targets here, Juliet 9, Hotel 9, Oscar 3, uh, were all very hot targets. And right to the um, northwest of Juliet 9 was the uh, a base area, the enemy, an enemy base area where they had... Uh, uh, the concentration of enemy troops and uh, stockpiles of uh, supplies, ammunition, and whatnot. Um, and to the uh, to the east, along that road that you see there, 
uh, it passes through Hotel 9, uh, was another base area called Base Area 609. Uh, and uh, majority of my operations when I became 1-0 were in that area. Uh, so I want to take a pause here to talk about uh, what the uh, duty cycle was for us uh, before I get back to describing subsequent missions. Uh, so uh, the duty cycle was comprised of uh, four, uh, was partitioned into four uh, segments. Uh, the first one was the uh, planning preparation uh, segment, which was uh, the, basically the start of the cycle. That's where you received your warning order and you, you entered into a training phase. Uh, the team leader would take uh, a visual reconnaissance uh, either from a Blackbird or some other utility aircraft. Uh, and it was interesting to note that neither CCS nor CCN uh, took VRs. I mean, the one zeros from those organizations did not conduct VRs uh, because they thought that that would be a tip off to the enemy that we're, we're going to be uh, visiting them soon. Uh, well, that was, I, I can't see the logic in that because you're at such an altitude uh, that the enemy couldn't really tell what you were looking at. Uh, and when you came down for a closer look, you would fly uh, a lengthy path that would pass over your prospective LZs and the enemy couldn't possibly know, uh, at least we thought so, could not possibly know uh, where along that flight path uh, your LZ was going to be. Uh, so you would take a VR and then uh, you would select your uh, prospective LZs and you would also take a look and what, how the terrain looked to you, as opposed as opposed to the way it was portrayed on the map, uh, and then you would, you know, select a, you know a notional uh, route towards your area of interest or your target within the target area. Uh, the uh, then the second uh, component of the of the cycle was mission execution. Uh, and uh, that was also, uh, respectively, a, a seven-day adventure. Uh, and uh, the only way uh, that you would uh, not stay seven days was if you got ran out of your LZ by the enemy. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> if, if you got into uh, an engagement with the enemy, which was almost always happened. Uh, that was considered uh, a TACI. TACI was acronym for uh, tactical emergency. Uh, that all, de declaration of a TACI enabled you to summon aircraft, uh, you know, combat aircraft, close air support to support you uh, in uh, fighting your way uh, out of whatever trouble you were in to continue your mission. Can I jump in with you speaking about Tacky? And we've spoken offline about uh, you seeing uh, numerous people declaring Tackies when it may not be necessary, or even prairie fire with the Tacky being uh, there at the end. You said a Tacky is to where you're still intent on carrying out the mission. Uh, what, what is a prairie fire? Is that when it's you're you're not in ten? It's blown. You're getting out. Tacky is going to continue on if you can. Yeah. So, uh, a tacky 
was basically, uh, given that you could uh, break contact with the enemy, you were supposed to continue your mission. You, uh, and normally, if you, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the team leaders uh, would declare attack E, and only when the situation wor worsened would they then transition to a prairie fire, and a prairie fire meant that you were, you know. You had wounded, uh, or you had KIAs, uh, or you were about to be overrun. And um, once the prairie fire was uh, declared by a 1 0, then the, the 7th Air Force would come to your rescue, uh, or uh, Vietnamese uh, air assets would come to your rescue. Uh, and uh, uh, we had a, a kind of a hardcore uh, S3, whose name was Major Jax. Uh, and uh, you would, if you got into contact with the enemy, um, you would contact uh, through Leghorn. Uh, or uh, if the uh, if you didn't have uh, radio contact with Leghorn, you had an emergency radio where you could contact the Airborne Triple C. Airborne Triple C was a C-130 aircraft that was constantly uh, flying a uh, uh, a uh, a route. Uh, in above Western Laos, and the purpose of the Airborne Triple C was to was to command and control air assets throughout North Vietnam and Laos, uh, and, uh, and and possibly I'm not sure, but possibly uh, also control air assets in certain areas of South Vietnam. Uh, they had a duty cycle, which was one aircraft uh, would be on the ground and another other aircraft would be flying its route. In the daytime, the Airborne Triple C was called Hillsboro. Uh, and at night, the Airborne Triple C, which was the other aircraft, would replace uh, the, uh, the aircraft on, on the daytime cycle. That was called Moonbeam. So your emergency radio would put you in contact with the Airborne Triple C, and the Airborne Triple C would devote all kinds of air support uh, to getting a, you know a team out of uh, out of danger or out of uh, you know a tactical you know a, a prairie fire emergency. <laughs> We had priority on air, <coughs> and uh, in a, during a prayer fire emergency, uh, Major Jax would not allow you <coughs> to come out uh, on an operation during just a attacky. I mean, you weren't supposed to anyway. You're supposed to try and break contact with the enemy and continue your mission. But he was pretty hardcore. Uh, some teams would get it into a desperate scrape, but wouldn't have any wounded, uh, and had not yet been surrounded. Or, but they would be in continual engagement, and they would, you know, the team leader might feel a little panicky and feel uh, as though fate was catching up with him, and uh, he might ask for an extraction. And Major Jack would come back, come back and say, "Great contact, continue mission." It was all, you know, all what he would always say, <clears throat> and that was a good thing. That was that was his job, uh, and he did it well. Uh, so, back on to the mission cycle. So after a mission, then you went into stand down for seven day, seven days. Uh, 
And uh, if you want to take R and R or uh, a little leave time, or just uh, you know stay in your in the billets and read a book or whatever, that was when you did it. And the last segment of the uh, of the duty cycle was the, the duty segment. And during that period, <clears throat> you would occasionally be assigned maybe twice a week uh, to go out and do external patrols uh, outside the perimeter. Or you would be assigned maybe once a week to man the bunker uh, on, you know, on the perimeter. Uh, or uh, you would be required to perform bunker maintenance and replace sandbags and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> interestingly, though, uh, St. Martin uh, basically said, I don't need a duty cycle. I want to go right back into rotation for, I'm ready for my next mission. Uh, so the, the duty cycle was basically three components when John was, uh, was one zero. And, uh, that was, uh, also during the, you know, the, uh, the duty cycle, the duty segment, you could also, uh, train. And every, every time you went out on external patrol, that was a training opportunity as well. So you could actually, uh, have more than a week uh, for uh, for training uh, when you can when you threw the the duty segment to include the patrolling, you had an opportunity to do some more training. Uh, this is a photo of uh, of R two New York, uh, you know, doing some weapons checks. Those fatigues that I'm wearing there were not the ones that I would wear to the field. Uh, they were, you know, camouflage version. Uh, but I found that they weren't necessarily the best camouflage. The guy to, to the left there uh, was uh, a guy that we referred to as Fat Albert. Uh, and... Uh, uh, Pete Wilson, uh, I, I, he was my one, one and a really good guy. And, uh, uh, as time went on, he, uh, wound up take, he was promoted to, to another team. Uh, and, uh, he made, uh, you know, as the team leader, he made some mistakes uh, that cost him his life. Uh, and uh, if we have time, maybe I can get into that. There's, uh, I had two, go, go back to the last, the last uh, photo, the one you just flashed. Bud? Was it the team photo or the yes, the team photo. Uh, let's see. Uh, hang on. Let me bring it up. There. Okay. So <clears throat> you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten people. Pull that up. Anyway. Uh, I had an American strap hanger. His name was Benish, who had the radio. Uh, and then Fat Albert was right behind me um, at the bottom. Uh, and I had two Wilsons on the team at that time. So Pete Wilson was there in the center. And then Hal Wilson uh, was my normal one-two. And he was, he was there to the right. And you notice uh, that 
most of these guys are carrying car 15s except for me uh and we'll we can talk about equipment later mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so back on to uh, uh to uh to the missions so uh so after the Oscar three uh, mission, which was just a simple placement of, uh, of a B-52 beacon, we went back uh, to the FOB and in due course, we received another mission. This one was you know, assigned to uh, Hotel 6. Now, I, I should mention that Hotel 9, where that St. Martin was briefly uh, one zero before getting replaced by Mike Potter, Hotel 9 was, the, uh, was an area where just before my arrival, uh, Sergeant First Class Sabatowski earned his Medal of Honor. So it was a hot area. Hotel Six was uh, at the border between Laos and Cambodia. Uh, and that's where three FOB to uh, Special Forces soldiers earned their medals of honor to include uh, Bob Howard. Uh, so that was a very hot area. And it turns out that th that was also the area where Fat Albert got killed. Uh, so uh, we were, you know, assigned Hotel 6. The same thing happened in terms of preparation. Potter went and got his warning order. Uh, and apparently was told by his drinking buddies that Hotel 6 was a very dangerous area. He got very nervous, but that didn't uh, energize him to, uh, to train the team. It was the same thing. He would we'd go out on the helipad and do dry runs of uh, maybe for an hour or so, do dry runs of the bat battle drill, then maybe we go out on one occasion, maybe two, uh, just one occasion to, to fire our weapons uh, on the range. And after each one of those training opportunities, he would head off uh, to the club and drink with his buddies. Uh, so uh, Potter was one zero, St. Martin was the one one, and I was the one two. And when we got to the Docto launch site, Potter declined when, when they, they said it, that it was time for insertion, Potter declined to go. Uh, and uh, he claimed that he felt sick to his stomach, and he said he, he couldn't go on the operation. Uh, our FOB commander was Lieutenant Colonel Apt, who took a helicopter and flew up to Docto and relieved Potter on the spot and turned to St. Martin and said, can you take this mission? And St. Martin said, yes. He, well, he first he looked at me and said whether I, I agreed. And then he turned to Colonel App and said, yes. So it was St. Martin and myself uh, and several yards went to Hotel 6. And that turned into, into a very interesting operation. So we, we landed on LZ. It turns out, as usual, we picked up trackers. 
uh, and uh, we, uh, but we didn't know it for sure. We went into a, uh, a perimeter defense uh, for, you know, around, uh, it was uh, for night defensive perimeter. And our point man, who was armed with an AK-47, spots the trackers coming up on us and opens fire on them. Uh, and uh, that is the signal for, you know, once you open fire, you're supposed to detonate all the claymores that are uh, outside your perimeter. Three of the claymores went off and one was had not gone off yet. St. Martin was standing up right behind that one remaining claymore. He was literally one foot away from the back of that claymore and was directing the team. And at his, at his feet, uh, just you know, a few meters away, uh, was the monyard who was responsible for that claymore. And he looks at the interpreter and say, shall I fire the claymore? This was a new guy on the team. And the, inter the interpreter says, yes, without even the check to see if anybody was in the safety zone. When the claymore went off, St. Martin was thrown up into the air, did a literally a 360 degree flip and landed on his feet, continued up to directing the team without missing a beat. Uh, so one of the lessons I learned from that is that the safety distance for a Claymore was just a safety protocol, but it wasn't necessarily uh, what you might use uh, in, uh, in the field. Uh, so thereafter, when I was team leader, uh, claymores were placed on the other side of a tree from where the claymore operator would be, you know, the team member would be. Uh, and you know, within the, uh, the hazard zone of the claymore backblast, uh, if there wasn't a tree available, then it would be planted in down slope a bit. Uh, and uh, that that would allow you to be able to see your claymore and ensure that it was constantly being, you know, erect and that an enemy was not trying to turn it around on you to face towards you uh, and, uh, and play that kind of a trick on a team, which, you know, occasionally happens. Uh, and, uh, so that, that was, you know, a lesson learned. We continued, uh, you know, tacky was declared, but we didn't even summon any aircraft. We just moved off, went into another perimeter, picked up in the following morning. I mean, we had killed uh, at least some of the trackers we had. So we had, we had dealt with that problem and we continued on, uh, toward in a westerly manner. Uh, and then one of our, all of a sudden we were in an area where the canopy was broken. I mean, it wasn't continuous canopy anymore, but with, you know, very tall, very enormous trees and, our point man pointed up towards the, the sky and there on a, on one of these trees were uh, field expedient was a field expedient ladder 
uh, embedded into the uh, into the trunk of the tree, all the way up to the crown uh, where the foliage was. And this was an observation post for an LZ watcher. Uh, whose duty was to uh, spread the alarm if uh, uh, if air assets were approaching or if a team was landing on an LZ uh, to summon uh, uh, an NVA force to deal with a recon team or uh, an exploitation force or tack air coming uh, into that into that sector, and then there was basically a row of similar trees stretching towards the north, and each one of them had these ladder rungs embedded into the into the trunk of the tree. We didn't notice it initially until the point man pointed it out that these rungs were above head level. So another less lesson learned was always look above yourself to, to see if there are any hazards uh, or any enemy located above you uh, rather than keeping your eyes fixated on the ground or in front or to the flanks. Uh, because I would have missed uh, those out those observation posts entirely had my point man not pointed those out to me. We were right in a, you know, uh, right on the other side of that tree was a clearing. Uh, and then on the other side of the clearing was a, a, a thin strip of woods. And right on the other side of the thin strip of woods was the road, the enemy's road. Uh, and that road was not depicted on a map. And I'm not sure if the map that you're, and you know, I, I provided a map for you to see that. Uh, at some point, uh, maybe not on this uh, podcast, but maybe on another, I can talk about Fat Albert and how he met his end in the same area. Uh, but uh, no, not that map, the other, the other map. Uh, but we didn't, we couldn't even see the road until we actually crossed this narrow strip of, uh, okay. Yeah, so that's Tango 7. Can you increase the size on that a bit? And move it to the right and up? The, um, for some reason, it's not allowing me to grab the screen and move it. Uh, okay, so, so I'll just des describe it as that uh, there was a road, you see, where You see where there's uh, a uh, a place name up towards the upper right hand corner, the northeast corner. There was a, a road descending from that from the road that you see descending all the way down using whatever uh, foliage you know whatever tree cover was available going down into Cambodia. So around where you see those grid numbers south from there, that line, that's Cambodia on the other side of that. And to the north and, and west is Laos. And it was in this area where Hotel 6 was. Uh, and uh, I'll I'll tell you a little bit about, about this area. So in this area, again, three medals of honor. 
And there was a reason why uh, this area was uh, considered hot. I didn't realize it at the time. This is a constant theme uh, that I have. Uh, that I, you know, it took me a while to discover that our S2 section at the FOB, which is the intelligence section, and the intelligence section at higher headquarters, at SOG headquarters in Saigon, were not doing their job totally inadequate uh, and uh, uh, I I can tell you that I don't doubt that a lot of you know a number of American lives are lost because of their incompetence uh, and I can get into that when I get in later on in, into some of the other operations but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll take a short excursion here and talk about fat Albert Okay, so Fat Albert had been my one one uh, uh, because we had uh, uh, a problem filling one 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 zero positions, uh, and because he had been on a number of operations with me, uh, he was given his own team. I can't remember the uh, the team. Arkansas. Arkansas. Okay. Uh, and uh, he had gone on one op. When I was away on leave, he had taken RT New York on an op. I was, in one, I was in on an extended leave. And it was after that, which was kind of like a practice run to see how well he did as a 1-0, mm -hmm. they gave him his own team, which is Arkansas. Um, and uh, uh, I believe... That Fat Albert was an 11 Foxtrot, which is the uh, an operations and intelligence specialist. He was a staff sergeant uh, and uh, smart guy. And he had been given uh, a mission into Hotel Six. Uh, and uh, the mission was that there was some intel uh, that north of the road where that village was pointed out on that, on that map, north of that was supposed to be a POW compound. There was some foggy intel about that, but allegedly that was the case. So Fred Albert decided that uh, his concept of operations was not to take a VR and he would dress his, uh, his entire uh, team, uh, which uh, I think he was going to take six men, six to eight men on this, were going to be dressed in NVA uniform to include pith helmet and NVA you know, AK-47s. Uh, and he was not going to take a VR because he didn't want to tip off the enemy that this was an area of interest and, you know, there was going to be a, an operation forthcoming. Uh, and he, he trained his team. Uh, and, uh, you know, just prior to uh, the mix, mission execution phase, uh, he was to give his brief back and he gave his brief back. Uh, and uh, because it was kind of high profile involving POW rescue and stuff like that, uh, he, he got, he presented his briefing to uh, the FOB commander and he did such a great job that he asked, the uh, the director of ground ops from SOG headquarters, who his name was Colonel Shungle, to come down and hear this great presentation about you know the uh, this planned POW rescue op. Uh, and uh, all the uh, 
the team leaders on the FOB who weren't in on out on an operation were ordered to attend. So there was kind of like an amphitheater arrangement where we had wall maps on and all this and a podium and all that kind of stuff. And the FOB commander and Colonel Shungle were sitting in attendance and all smiling and happy. And uh, Fat Albert gives a great presentation. But I noticed that there was something wrong with the wall map wall map behind him that he was pointing to referring to uh, there was had been uh, an overlay uh, there was a the map was covered with plastic plastic sheeting and there had been a drawn in with grease pencil the outline of a uh, I believe it was Route 96, Laotian Route 96, which descended from the lateral route, Route 110, from Route 110 into Cambodia. And that somebody had erased uh, that drawn in route marker. Uh, so Fat Albert, when he was pointing to the map, said his LZ was at a certain point where I happened to know that was where the, where the road was. Remember, I'd been there before. So at the end of his presentation, uh, the FOB commander uh, and uh, Colonel Shungle were very congratulatory, and they were saying, that's the way you guys should be presenting uh, your uh, uh, brief backs, and that's the way to plan a mission, and we're sure that this is going to be a successful mission, and a lot of credit to, uh, uh, to uh, Pete Wilson, Sergeant Wilson, for this presentation. Uh, and except, you know, all these laudatory comments. So I and Doug Miller, who was then team leader of RT Vermont, went up to him and said, I said to him, you're something wrong with your presentation. There is a road there and your primary LZ is right on top of it. And he denied that that was the case. And I said, I'm absolutely sure. I've been there before. I know where the road is. You need to change your LZ. He refused to do that. And he denied that there was a road there. And I said, did you take an L uh, a, a VR? He said, no. And he explained why he didn't. And I said, and he pointed to the target folder that was on the podium and said, there's no road there. And he opened it up and there, there was a map in the target folder. And there wasn't any road there. And then I, I took a close look at the target folder and it was outdated by two years. Uh, and I said, this is, this is the wrong file. There's another file on Hotel 6. And he went into kind of like deer, deer in the headlights kind of look about him. And then he said, it doesn't matter. That's where I'm going to go. I said, you're going to get in trouble. I was so concerned about it that I immediately left uh, and I went to then uh, Captain Howard, or, you know, the, then the uh, recon company commander, and I told him what had transpired in my conversation uh, with Fat Albert. And he said, 
Okay, I'll go talk to him. Fat Albert refused to change uh, his mission plan. Uh, and then uh, when Howard came back from discussing with him, I asked him in follow-up, you know, is, is he going to change his, his LZ? And he said, nope, he refuses to change his LZ. Well, I, I'm going to take it. I'm going to talk to the, uh, to the FOB commander. And Howard said, no, don't do that. He's the team leader. It's his decision. Well, uh, the end of the story was uh, he landed where I told him not to land. He was immediately beset by uh, an enemy tracker team. Uh, he couldn't uh, uh, avoid them. He couldn't uh, uh, get them. Uh, he, he couldn't use, no matter what tricks of the trade he employed, he, he just couldn't shed, shed the trackers. They finally caught up with him, opened fire on the team, shot one of his Montagnards. Fat Albert directed his 1-1 to head towards an LZ, which was basically downslope from the ridge that they were on. And he stayed with the, uh, the wounded uh, Montagnard and helped, you know, started carrying him down uh, down the slope, and then there was a burst of fire, and Fat Howard got shot. Uh, the one one was an inexperienced guy who did not stop uh, to see about the condition of your, you know, the rest of the team. He just headed uh, straight for the LZ and didn't look back, leading the remnants of the team towards the LZ and didn't even realize that Fat Albert uh, had, uh, had fallen out. Turns out that I was had bright light duty on that particular occasion. So uh, that segment of the team minus one mountain yard and Fat Albert uh, landed at the, at the launch site, and I was getting my team ready to, to go in on a on a rescue, even though it was almost dusk. Uh, and then I got an emergency phone uh, uh, radio call telling me to return to the FOB immediately. Uh, so I, I spoke to the one one and he was really in a panic and, you know, kind of in shock. And I said, don't worry, tomorrow morning, we're going to go in. You're going to come with me. We're going to track, you'll follow your track from, from the extraction LZ to where, uh, you last saw fat Albert and we're going to recover him or rescue him. So we all flew back to the FOB. He went into uh, a debriefing, and I went to the recon company to find out what was why they summoned me back to the FOB, and they told me that I wasn't in the army any longer. My uh, ETS had expired, and I didn't even realize it. My uh, my term of service had had lapsed, uh, and. Uh, so I was officially, I was no longer officially uh, a, a soldier uh, and had to re-enlist. So the following day, I, you know, the paperwork and, and so forth, and they, they pulled together a scratch team to go out and try and rescue Fat Albert. They couldn't recover him or, or the Montyard's uh, remains. So uh, that, that and other things 
uh, that had occurred during the course of you know the various operations I, I run. That was that was kind of like the, the the last straw for me in terms of trust uh, of the S two shop that we had because it was their responsibility. They were the ones who gave him the wrong file. Uh, and uh, that was emblematic of the kind of mistakes that the S2 shop made. Uh, so more on that as we get into uh, I go back to the uh, to the Hotel 6 operation then that I had I had been on uh, where Potter had been relieved and St. Martin had been installed by Colonel Apt as the new one zero on the spot while we were at the launch site. So we went in on this operation. And as I said, we got into contact, broke contact, proceeded towards our destination. And I mentioned that we had gone through a, a very narrow strip of woods where uh, on the other side of it was Highway 96. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, on the other side of 96, on the opposite side were was more rainforest. So we crossed the road and right on the other side was a trail that paralleled the road. And just above us on that trail was coaxial communication cable, which was very significant because that was back then, that was the equivalent of a fiber optic cable. That was kind of a trunk line that connected major headquarters. Okay. So we didn't have a wiretap uh, set with us. So we had to, we, we called in our discovery. Uh, St. Martin decided we were going to follow this trail that was parallel the road. And while we were proceeding down this trail, all of a sudden St. Martin uh, holds up his fists and then lowers his hand for us to take cover. And before I could react, along comes an NVA squad down the road and I'm totally exposed. And as soon as I see uh, this uh, squad leader, this RPG man, the squad leader is actually walking down the road reading a pamphlet, some communist pamphlet. Uh, and they aren't paying attention uh, to the periphery of the road. They're just, you know, walking right down. And I pulled a grenade uh, off, of my, off of my gear. I pulled the pin and I was ready to throw it. So another lesson learned I learned from that was you, you can't just throw a grenade through underbrush. You had to find a, a throwing lane through the vegetation. Otherwise, the grenade would come back at you and you, you know, it would be fratricidal. So that was instantaneous where I figured I saw this brush in front of me. Then I just looked up a bit and there was a hole uh, in the first layer of canopy. And I was just waiting there frozen while everybody else was, in, was crouched down below, uh, eyesight and they never noticed me. Fortunately, I, I hung on to the, uh, uh, the safety pin and I reinserted it and, and rendered it safe and put it back on my web gear. But there was another, another lesson learned. Uh, and uh, so while we were heading back down, you know, continued to, to follow this trail, we got a call on the radio 
and said, you know, uh, stop what you're doing. Uh, we're going to send in a team with a wiretap. So uh, we went back to where that uh, open area was. We're going to use that as the LZ for extraction. We're going to be extracted. And another team was going to come in with a wiretap and tap into the, uh, uh, the coaxial cable. Uh, everything went off smoothly. Uh, I have no idea how maybe they thought that this was an extraction and not an extraction insertion, but they didn't come looking uh, for that team until after they had started monitor, had inserted the uh, the wiretap and and started picking up uh, enemy transmissions, recording enemy transmissions, uh, and somebody at one end or the other uh, of the cable realized that there was a drop off in, in continuity and sent and sent it, uh, a, you know, a, a squad to find out what was the problem with the line. And so that team got run out. Uh, and uh, it's a, uh, Pardon me here. Okay. So the uh, that turned out to be a successful operation. They picked up quite a bit of information on that wiretap. Uh, but what was interesting is that coaxial cable led from followed Route 96 from the northern intersection with Route 110, which was where the base area 609 was, and followed that road down into Cambodia. Later on, I found out why that particular area was so hot uh, and why three medals of honor were earned there is because, again, I there was actually uh, a uh, a full division of NVA a little further to the east towards the border, full division. Okay, that's about 11,000 NVA, not including the uh, support slice, not, in, not including artillery that's assigned to them uh, by, the, by a higher headquarters. Uh, and as far as I know, no one uh, in recon had been told that there was a division located there. And how did I discover it? After I, years after, uh, when security clearances uh, were no longer effective, I discovered formerly top, top secret documents online that indicated that's the, the first NVA infantry division was located right in that sector. Now, RS2 certainly was, had the clearance and the uh, uh, need to know. Certainly SOG headquarters had the need to know, but none of that information was, was passed to us. As a matter of fact, uh, if you're curious, you can look up an operation. You type in for a search called RT Pennsylvania and see what happened to them. The entire team was wiped out. They were operating just east of Hotel 6, further east 
in Hotel Six, right in the vicinity of that division. And they didn't, they had no idea that there was a division headquarters there with all the units, regiments and, and so forth, all located in that in that one area. No one told them. And the whole and as a as a result, you know, had he had this team leader known, he might have taken other measures, you know, maybe select different LZs, maybe used uh, some tactical discretion. I don't know. We'll never know because the whole team got wiped out. Uh, moving on uh, to uh, subsequent missions. And I'll pick up on the, on the theme again uh, of uh, the failures of our intelligence section and that of uh, uh, SOG headquarters. Uh, St. Martin was, was called in for uh, you know, another warning order. Uh, the target area was Tango 7. Uh, he did his VR, he did his LZ selection, he decided what his route was going to be. We trained, we prepared, we were inserted, uh, and uh, John uh, takes an azimuth that's going to take us towards the area of interest. We were supposed to go up, it was a road watch mission. We were supposed to go up to Route 110, establish a surveillance post and watch and watch traffic and report. <clears throat> that was the mission. Uh, and we immediately uh, wound up uh, with, uh, with trackers. Uh, we, they caught up with us. We managed to uh, shoot it out with them, kill a number of them. They weren't, they didn't wound or kill any of ours. And we continued the mission and uh, proceeded up towards uh, Route 110. And uh, while we were in route, we came to a patch of uh, dead bamboo. And, uh, but if you want to bring up the map of Tango 7, that'd be great. Grab that. Tango 7. Okay. Now I should point out that the boundaries of, of these various target areas were not fixed uh, in stone. Uh, the uh, those boundaries could shift to north, south, east, or west um, marginally. Uh, so, but this was uh, typically uh, the, uh, I would say, kind of like the, the western limit uh, of the Tango 7 target area. <clears throat> now, I want to Point out some topography to you. Uh, notice that the contour intervals here, of 20 meters. So this might look like, you know, relatively, you know, rough terrain, but not, you know, exceptionally, exceptionally so. But when you figure out that the, the terrain interview, the, the, the uh, 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 the uh, contour intervals were 20 meters. Then you get to understand uh, an understanding that these were really uh, pr this is really much more rugged than it than it appears. Notice what's up uh, to the north there. You see that road network there it doesn't seem to go anywhere. It seems to meander around. Okay. Well, earlier versions of, of this map. This was this map was dated 1971. Earlier versions of this map 
uh, did not have those uh, those roads up there. It was just uh, Route 110 going from west, or I should say, uh, northwest to the east towards the, uh, the tri-border area. So what does this, this road network signify? Well, this was the base area and logistics complex for base area 609. All along in that area were uh, concentrations of troops and concentrations of logistics supplies. So these were access roads to uh, logistics facilities and maintenance facilities in base area 609. Uh, you'll also notice uh, within the frame of the uh, target area, there's a road that's descending south from Route 110. And it says, I think if you were to look at it, uh, it says Old Route 96. Old Route 96 terminated at some point, but then converted to a cart path. Uh, the, and you see down at the bottom, if you scroll up, scroll up a bit, you see it goes down into, in, into Cambodia. Well, the enemy stopped using that and we're using new Route 96, which is over there where that uh, villages that you see over to the right-hand side, just below Route 110. Uh, so we, we encountered this area of dead bamboo uh, where you see this, near where you see this other marker, uh, this script there below Route 110 signifying another village. Now, there was no village there because it had been wiped out by repeated B-52 strikes. This area was heavily uh, bombed uh, along Route 110, especially towards the northwest. But uh, we encountered uh, the uh, this dead bamboo area near where that village was. And <clears throat> what John St. Martin might have done was to skirt around the dead bamboo rather than go right through it. But he went right through it. It's extremely noisy. Dead bamboo, if you step on it, uh, even if you step on the, the leaves or the culms, it's called, it's, I mean, it's very loud. Uh, you probably, some of you uh, have, have probably know what I'm talking about. You've seen uh, dead bamboo or dry bamboo used uh, for gardening and stuff like that. You know uh, that it, you know, if they strike one another, it sounds like a gunshot. If you step on it, it sounds like a, so we couldn't help but make noise going through there. And as we were crossing that, that area of dead bamboo, all of a sudden we heard shouting in Vietnamese. Uh, and uh, our uh, interpreter didn't say anything. John didn't ask the interpreter what the guy was saying, which would have been pretty instructive had he asked that. <coughs> but the interpreter failed in his duty in not informing John what this yelling was about, what the Vietnamese was saying. <coughs> didn't find out until after the operation that uh, that the guy was saying, this NVA was saying, 
There's Americans in the dead bamboo. Uh, had we known that, uh, everything would have turned out a lot differently. But uh, John didn't know it. And I was still in the uh, dead bamboo area. John and the uh, point man had actually entered into uh, the green fringe and seen what was where that voice was emanating from, basically in the vicinity where that voice was emanating from. And he passed back the signal, which was like that, which indicated buildings, a building. Uh, and uh, so he, everybody in the team got inside the uh, the green verge uh, and uh, there was a fallen tree right in front of us and on the other side of the, the fallen tree a little more shrubbery around and then there was this fairly large open area, immaculately clean, not one fallen leaf, not one twig on it. And in the middle of that were three large buildings of heavy log structure. And this was significant because for all the occasions where I had seen uh, structures uh, in Laos, uh, they were all made of bamboo, but not these structures. These were all heavy log structures. I mean, one of them was longer than the uh, uh, the Recon Company headquarters building back at FOB2. Uh, and even regimental headquarters were made of bamboo. Uh, so this was obviously something that was, that exceeded a regimental headquarters, which would mean some other major headquarters, command and control center, a divisional headquarters, who knows what it was, but it was something, you know, rather important. It was getting towards dusk and... John saw a, a great opportunity uh, and thought that with an eight-man recon team, we should attack this major building within this cluster of four buildings and see if we couldn't take a senior officer prisoner or capture documents. Uh, and I said, maybe we should try a, a different approach. I said, why not uh, bring in uh, air support, bomb it, and then go in and pick up what intel we could get. Uh, that's what we tried to do. We, we withdrew further into the green area We sent a message to higher headquarters. Uh, they told us that they wanted to, us to exploit that target immediately and bomb it. We were reluctant to throw a smoke grenade because then, again, not knowing what that Vietnamese had said that we had already been detected, that would, it would mark our position as well as the enemy's. So he didn't want to do that. So we tried to adjust uh, an aerial bombardment by sound. Listening to where the aircraft was in relationship to where the team was, tried to bring them closer and closer uh, to where this compound was. That didn't work out. So, uh, I mean, they dropped a couple of bombs, but they were nowhere close. Not a leaf fluttered down from the canopy. 
So John decided we were, we were going to attack that building anyway in the hopes of, you know, capturing whatever we could. We went back to where that fallen log was, which was a fairly substantial log. He arranged the team into two rows of four. The rear row had a radio man who was uh, John Blau. Uh, and three other uh, Montyards to include both. Here's John Blau, who he, he also became a team leader later on after a couple more missions. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, it, so the M79s that we had were in the rear, the second rank. And the front rank consisted of me, John, and Point Man, and one other Montyard. So we we're going. So John pulled out a you know a hand grenade, pulled the pin. He motioned for me to do the same thing, which I did. We were going to run forward and assault that uh, that structure, throw grenades in there, and try and you know. Find out what we can get. John took a step across this fallen log, this fallen tree. And as soon as he had done that, and the enemy opened up, and I had spotted a you know a column of enemy crossing uh, the open area at Port Arms. And I thought John had seen them too, because they were, I mean, they were, he and I were, you know, had the same perspective of, of this, of this area. I, I couldn't believe he, he never saw them. Uh, and they opened up on John and one round uh, took him in the ankle. The next round, uh, which kind of spun him part way. Another round caught him in the, in the leg. And the third round, as he was spinning around, caught him across his stomach and opened up his abdomen. He fell back onto my side of the log. Fortunately, his grenade fell on the opposite side. I threw my grenade towards where these enemy were firing from, and they were very close. I mean, very close, which is the usual situation when you're in dense uh, vegetation. Uh, and their firing diminished. The uh, the Montyards started firing at the enemy. The M79s started striking where the enemy fire was coming from. I dropped down to John's side and I saw that his intestines had exited his abdomen. Uh, John, I, you know, I removed his web gear and his rucksack, his weapon, placed them to the side, got, got a full view of the wound, uh, 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 one zero always carried what was called the one zero kit, which was a medical kit, and the medical kit contained morphine syrettes. So I tried to. Uh, I reached into the into the one zero kit, pulled out a morphine syrette, stuck it in his leg, and tried to squeeze it. And it wouldn't squeeze. It, you know, the morphine would not eject. So I grabbed another one. I did the same thing. It wouldn't. It wasn't working. I don't. I didn't know what I was doing wrong. I found out later that I had never been instructed on how to use a morphine syrette. Usually, the morphine syrette came with a pin that was inserted into the nozzle of the syrette. 
and to and that pin was used to penetrate uh, into the in, past the nozzle into the into the body of the serrette where the morphine was, and then you withdraw the pin and then you use it. But the two serrettes that I had pulled out, neither of them had a pin. But I found out that there were other serrettes in there that did have a pin. Uh, had I known how to administer the serrette properly and inject the morphine, later on I was told by medics back at uh, the FOB that had I administered the, the morphine, uh, John would have died because of the, the effect that the morphine had on the circulatory system. The circulatory system would have collapsed uh, because of, uh, you know, the loss of blood that he had. So, uh, I, uh, took John's intestines and I piled them back into, uh, the, uh, abdominal cavity, took his undershirt, which had been made had been breached somewhat, but was still generally intact. And I covered his intestines and tucked in uh, the uh, uh, his undershirt inside his belt line, tightened up, really cinched up his belt line. Uh, and meanwhile, he's he's screaming bloody murder. Uh, and which wasn't a good thing because then the enemy knew we had wounded. Uh, I then organized uh, what we we're going to do next, which is I, I handed off his weapon to one Montyard, his rucksack to another Montyard, his web gear to yet another Montyard. Uh, and I tried to get them to help me drag him towards the LZ. And the Montyards didn't have sufficient upper body strength. I mean, their army basically, with the with the adrenaline flowing, basically turned into noodles. They they could not muster the strength. I had to drag John by myself. John outweighed me by uh, probably thirty pounds. I don't know. Uh, and uh, I had to drag him through underbrush back to this area of uh, dead bamboo. Uh, and uh, after we, we got it just, uh, you know, about 10 meters inside the area of dead bamboo, my, my arm strength gave out. I, I couldn't drag him, you know, anywhere further. Then we started taking fire from the enemy. Uh, the enemy was starting to assemble and they saw an opportunity for them to assault and uh, and take out, you know, reek hunting because now they knew that we were burdened with a casualty. Uh, by then, we've called the prayer fire. We've reported that uh, the one zero uh, was WIA. Reported the nature of his of his wounds and stuff like that, <clears throat> uh, and uh, it was. It was dusk already. It was getting dark. It was dark, actually, because in the mountains, dusk comes pretty quick because the, the sun is obscured by elevated terrain. So we were, uh, you know, the, the sun was already behind the mountains, and the only illumination we had uh, was, you know, reflected from you know, the clouds, and it was starting to rain. And uh, the, uh, we had a, a forward air controller and a Covey rider who had come to our rescue. And while we were being, while I was dragging John towards the, uh, 
towards the dead bamboo, they were running strafing runs using what rockets they had. They had so this was uh, a uh, an O2 uh, forward air controlled aircraft, which only had four rocket launcher tubes. So they only had four rockets, and they start they started using uh, the uh, the rockets on where the uh, uh, where the enemy was from, and the enemy was returning fire, firing on the uh, the FAC. They exhausted the the rockets that they had. And the only armament they had left was the Covey Rider uh, had an M16. And he opened up the window and started firing down on the enemy and the, the forward air controller started making low, plat, uh, low passes at treetop level, trying to get the enemy to redirect their fire away from us and towards the aircraft. Very valiant. Uh, uh, attempt to uh, to save uh, RT New York uh, at the risk of their own lives. Uh, and as I said, it was starting to rain and they were flying below cloud cover and the cavalry was on the way. So uh, the uh, uh, A-1 Sky Raider aircraft were en route. But before they could even get there, here arrives on the scene uh, three UH-1D helicopters, two for extraction. One is the chase aircraft, which had the medic on it. And it was so dark that the, uh, that the lead helicopter coming in had to turn on uh, its spotlight in order to see us. And this while rain is starting to pelt around us. Uh, while this is going, you know, while this helicopter is inbound, I have to get John ready for a string extraction, which is where they, because the helicopter wasn't going to land in the, in the dead bamboo because they were concerned about blade strikes and disabling the aircraft. So this was going to be a string extraction using ropes, propelling ropes, uh, and uh, with uh, loops tied into them. Uh, so I, I put uh, a, a number of, uh, I was going to put on the first ship a number of Montagnards. Uh, and uh, with John St. Martin. Uh, and then I discovered that you know, I had to rig up John St. Martin for the extraction. And his extraction harness had not been set up, which was, you know, a mistake on his part, which normally the extraction rig, which was then called a Hansen rig, uh, was supposed to be pre-measured, uh, you know, to fit the the body conformity of, of, the, of the person to be extracted. It was not done. Mine was, so I took my extraction rig and put it onto John. And when the first ship came in, I was able to hook him in with uh, four Montagnards. Four or five Montagnards, four, five Montagnards. So remaining on the ground was John Blau, myself, and one Montagnard. Uh, I should say that before I, before the helicopters arrived on scene, I learned something from my Montagnards. Uh, Two Montagnards, they were brothers, as a matter of fact, on the same team, the point man and his brother. 
went to you know the where their bamboo was still standing, but away from where John St. Martin was, you know, crying out in pain and where the rest of the team was located. And they started shaking the bamboo to attract the enemy, the enemy's fire towards them and away from John and, and the rest of us. That was a valuable lesson to be learned. I'll, I'll talk about the other lessons uh, to be learned in it at the end, tail end of this discussion. But John was extracted on the first ship and then the other uh, extraction aircraft came in to pick up the remaining three of us. And John, remember John's extraction rig was not ready to go. So the only thing that I could do in haste was to tie it into a Swiss seat Swiss seat is basically a, uh, a you use a, a rope or a strap around your uh, waist and thighs, typically used for repelling, and generally only used in an you know, extreme circumstance for extraction. Meanwhile, you know it's raining like hell now. I. I formed this uh, strap, the Hanson rig, into a Swiss seat and hook in. And the radio is with me. I hook that into the, 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 the string that's next to me. And we start going up, uh, you know, rising above the canopy. And as we as we're rising, the FAC is taking fire. The helicopters are taking fire. Uh, the A1s who are trying to suppress the enemy fire, they're taking fire. And then all of a sudden, we started taking the anti-aircraft fire from 22, 23-millimeter uh, and 57-millimeter anti-aircraft guns which are bursting right below us as we're trailing behind the helicopter on the end of the strings as it's, uh, you know, trying to depart the area and rising into the, into the clouds. And the helicopter speed uh, is in excess of 100 miles an hour uh, when it's going full tilt. But there's rainstorms all over the place. And uh, the rain is coming down in sheets. And every, every, I mean, the rain was pelting. And, you know, it, it was really painful uh, when you consider the, the speed of the falling rain and the speed of the aircraft as it impacted your, your body. And it was just like, to me, but worst pain I experienced was the strap that was in that uh, was that formed the uh, Swiss seat had twisted and was embedding itself into my crotch, and I was the while that was going on the the radio was swinging back and forth and colliding with me uh, as it was on the other was on the other string. So I snatched that radio, got the handset up and was begging the pilot to set down, even in enemy territory, uh, telling him that uh, if I passed out, I might fall out of the uh, Swiss seat. He refused to do that. <laughs> And uh, continued through this rainstorm. And we, by good fortune, uh, back then, the launch site had a, a jeep uh, allocated to it. And the jeep's headlights were on to illuminate the airstrip. 
Had that Jeep's headlights not been on, we would have bypassed. We wouldn't have even seen uh, the airstrip. So uh, the uh, the helicopter comes around on final and you know approaches along uh, the uh, uh, and it's it's dark and it's raining and the pilot has, has lost depth perception. So as he's attempting to land, and I'm on the lowest part of the, uh, the string. The other, you know, John Blau and another Montagnard are higher up on the string. I hit the runway like a ton of bricks. Uh, and then he's, the helicopter starts dragging me along uh, the, uh, the asphalt of the, uh, the airstrip. And something in my backpack of of metallic nature causes a shower of sparks so I look like a comet coming along uh, the runway and I'm looking up at the helicopter with this shower of sparks around me and there's the crew chief looking down at me and I'm, I'm wondering what the hell are you doing are you going to do something about this? And apparently he finally was able to tell the helicopter pilot that he was dragging me behind uh, the, uh, uh, dragging me along the asphalt. So the helicopter pilot raises up and brings me up off the, uh, the ground. And as he approaches where the, uh, the Jeep is, then he descends, and I hit the uh, hit the asphalt again like a ton of bricks. God. Uh, so he lands. I mean, you know, the bright light team is out there. They're making sure that the rope doesn't entangle with the rotors and stuff like that. They detach me and and the other guys uh, from the strings. The helicopter pilot turns off the helicopter, bails out. He runs over to me. Turns out he's the company commander for the helicopter company that's in support of us. And, and uh, he's apologizing like hell. But I was fine. You know, aside from being roughly treated, I wasn't injured at all. Uh, and uh, But the first helicopter, it was raining so furiously that uh, the helicopter missed the airstrip that was outside of Ben Head, then missed the launch site airstrip and flew all the way to Kontum and landed at the airfield at Kontum, where John had had lost so much blood that he was at, at the brink of death. They loaded him onto a helicopter and flew him direct directly from there uh, to Pleiku Field Hospital. Uh, and uh, he suffered, you know, very substantial injuries, as you can imagine. Lost a lot of blood. It was a miracle that he survived. It was only due to his fortitude and uh, and the fact that he was a strong, you know, powerful, powerfully built fellow uh, that he survived that. It wasn't until the following day, after I'd gone through debriefing and stuff like that, that I looked at my web gear and I was, you know, going to get it cleaned up and and reconstituted and, and stuff like that. That I that I noticed that the uh, where the sparks had been coming from was the Claymore mine that was on the back of my web gear, on, on, mounted on a, in a patch. Uh, on my web gear, uh, a pouch on my web gear. Uh, and it was literally had abraded down so much that the cap well had been exposed and it was just a hair's 
width away from the the cap being exploded by the friction of me being dragged down uh, the run the runway at the air at the airstrip. Uh, so uh, the the lessons learned were don't take a an azimuth and go directly from A to B uh, from your LZ to your target. Always use dog legs and use a, a circuitous path to get to your destination. Next, don't cross dead bamboo. Always go around it. Uh, next, tell your damn inter interpreter what his duties are. I, I, you know, this guy was a veteran interpreter for the team and didn't understand that he his duty was to tell the team leader in real time what an enemy was saying. He didn't understand that. It was just amazing to me. Uh, that uh, you should not bite off more than you can chew. We made some mistakes tactically. We should have used uh, a, uh, a smoke grenade to mark that compound withdrawn and let uh, the Air Force strike it. As a matter of fact, I didn't know this at the time, but we could have called a Spectre gunship and have them come on the scene that would serve to protect us uh, in our perimeter, but also, uh, just, you know, just, you know, just lace that area. I also, uh, in a, another lesson learned, uh, was always ensure that everybody's extraction rig was, uh, was ready to go. Uh, and, uh, then I also learned that because I was only a one-one, and I was I was told that I was my description of that compound was not believed because they thought that I didn't have enough experience to know what the hell I was seeing in front of my own eyes. There was no follow-up. Here we had a gigantic discovery of, you know, an important installation. And there was no follow-up in there until after a whole month had elapsed. And they sent in a company to do a sweep of the area. They did not go to the coordinates that we had indicated were where these buildings were. They went everywhere else. And they, there was a, a U-shaped ridge that surrounded this compound that gave them protection from B-52 strikes. So that was another lesson that I learned that I applied later on to look for similar geography along uh, highways where the enemy would seek protection of elevated terrain from uh, aerial bombardment. So this company went in and they found three battalion bivouacs. Later on in life, I discovered what was there. And it was the, the uh, sanctuary location for the 66th uh, NVA Infantry Regiment, which was Ho Chi, Minh, Ho Chi Minh's favorite uh, infantry formation, favorite battalion, regiment rather. Uh, and 
you may remember, you may know uh, that if anybody's seen, uh, read the book, We Were Soldiers Once, and saw, you know, the movie about uh, uh, the Cav, you know, attacking into the Yadrang Valley. That was the 68th, 66th NVA Regiment. Uh, so it was the assessment of the, uh, the FAC and the Cully Rider that we were being enveloped by the time we were being extracted, we were being enveloped by, they were receiving the volume of fire from a, from a full battalion of NVA. The other battalions of the regiment were hitting the road because they knew, uh, you know, uh, the consequences. They knew that there would be uh, an aerial bombardment coming their way. So they, they set one battalion to try and get us. Meanwhile, the other two battalions were getting the, making their way out, out of the uh, out of the area. Uh, and uh, there were, there were other lessons to be learned uh, that uh, they, that paid me dividends subsequently, but the discovery by the company of those three battalion bivouac areas, they were field fortifications actually, was that yes, indeed, there was a regiment there. Yes, indeed, there was something significant. Yes, indeed, they should have investigated those grid coordinates that I had provided them, but did not. And I, I challenged the company commander and asked him why they had not. And that's when he told me, well, we didn't think uh, that you really knew what you were doing as a mayor one one. And I said, and then when you found the battalion uh, entrenchments, the three battalion entrenchments that didn't ring a bell that there was a regiment located there. And he kind of gave me this dumb look of he had no argument for me. Uh, so that was an interesting and very dramatic episode. Uh, before I went to uh, the uh, debriefing, it was traditional for an incoming team to be greeted at the helipad by the company commander and the first sergeant, and they would give you a beer, or, or in my case, I didn't drink, so they had a uh, soda waiting for me drank that as we arrived on the helipad. Uh, and uh, it was also customary that the Americans would, would get a steak dinner uh, at the mess hall, regardless of time of day. Uh, it, it kind of, you know, a reward for surviving your mission. Uh, so myself and John Blau, went to the uh, to the mess hall with the company commander whose name was uh, Captain Goulet at that time. And I think the I think the first sergeant was I'm, I'm not precisely sure, but it was either Billy Greenwood, or Norm Don Doney. Uh, and they were basically there to listen to our account of what had happened. Uh, and uh, I was, I started explaining to him. And then when I, when I started talking about how, yes, Captain Goulet, handsome guy, got killed, unfortunately. Uh, when I started talking about, uh, St. Martin's plan to attack uh, these, these large buildings with an eight-man reconnaissance team, which turned out to be maybe a base area for a regiment or you know something greater than a regiment, I started laughing. 
I mean, I really, it, it was a combination of the adrenaline, you know, and, you know, all the drama uh, and the, the absolute hilarity of the idea of an eight-man reconnaissance team attempting to take on God knows what was in, was in those buildings and in the surrounding area. I started laughing and uh, they all started looking. John Blau was looking at me like I was crazy. The captain and the first sergeant were looking at me as I as, as though I was crazy. I was all I was almost laughing so hard, tears were coming out of my eyes. I I patted John Blau on the shoulder. He started laughing then because then he caught he understood why I was laughing because it was so so damn stupid what we were attempting to do uh and from and right right at that point uh goulet and the first sergeant exchanged a glance and looked at me and said would you like to you know be one zero of rt in new york i said okay so uh the next operation for me and it was Billy Greenwood, now that I remember. Uh, the next operation for me was a bright light mission. So I went to uh, Doc to launch site. And at the end, towards the end of the, uh, the mission, I get a call on the radio saying, come back to the FOB. Uh, and, uh, you, we got a mission for you. Oh, God. Okay. So I go back and they want me to pull a uh, bomb damage assessment. A BDA was one of the most hazardous missions, uh, around. I didn't really know that until the first sergeant who had given me the warning order, said, this is really hazardous, and the history is that a team will go in, land on an LZ, it would, after a B-52 strike, there would be a lot of rubble and fallen trees and stuff like that, and getting through that rubble takes a you know, while, and by, by that time, the enemy is already aware that you're on the ground, because it's what we do. We always do BDAs after B-52 you know, B strikes. And oh, by the way, they're, all, they're going to see the helicopters you know, deposit you on your LZ. So they're going to come after you. So no team has lasted more than a day. So if, the, if, if you land uh, at dusk and you make your way, or, or you know, in the late afternoon, and you make way, your way through the... Uh, uh, through the rubble, you're you're only going to have a you know a couple hours to take photographs or you know find anything of intelligence value before the enemy's on you, and then you know you're going to likely be extracted under fire. So with that warning, I said, "Well, I want to try something different." I said, uh, "I want." Uh, to land immediately after the B-52 strike on the beaten zone. Then I would get my intel then and then get extracted before nightfall. And he thought I was crazy for, for that, but uh, he said, all right, well, it, let's see how that works. And uh, that's exactly what happened. We land on the beaten zone after the dust has settled from the B-52 strike. And uh, this is in the vicinity of Route 110. And route and the Route 10 is on elevated. Uh, uh, you know, so we landed in a stream valley that was pockmarked with B-52, you know, bomb craters. Uh, and uh, there were 
all this water accumulated. So we, we had to climb up uh, the side of the, the, uh, the stream valley onto the road. And then I, I pointed the, uh, the point man down, down the road. And he gave me this look like, what? Are you crazy? But, uh, you know, I had a clear view of, from, from the road about this blasted heath, this, this area that had been uh, blown to shit by two, B, two B, B-52 uh, sorties. Uh, so I had all this perfect panorama. I started taking photographs. And as we were walking along the road, periodically there were bunkers along the side of the road where if, if a uh, truck driver uh, and his assistant got caught out in the open on the road, they could duck into uh, you know, a roadside bunker to take shelter uh, if that became necessary. So I took photos of, of the bunkers and, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, and if, if you bring up that picture of uh, Tango 7 again, the map, You there, bud? Sir, hang on one second. Um, share screen, Tango 7. There we go. So you see uh, up where that uh, village is in the upper left-hand corner or near the upper left-hand corner where there's a the intersection of Route 110 and Old 96 is, and you see that where the where the rope the road takes a loop, first southeast and then up uh, northeast. Uh, there, that's a hilltop. So I decided that we'd expose ourselves long enough on this open road, which was totally denuded of any vegetation whatsoever. We ascended that, uh, that slope. And when we got to the top, again, another superb view of all that destroyed area, I discovered looking both ways, all, you know, where, where the B-52 strike had happened, and not a single bomb had landed on the road at all. It was all off to the off to the side. Uh, and one of the bomb craters from at least a 500 pounder was right at the top of that hill. And looking down into the bomb crater, there was an opening at the bottom, revealing an enemy tunnel. Now the enemy had no reason obvious to me anyway, given that they owned all of this real estate under canopy, triple canopy, typically rugged terrain. Why would they have something underground when they could place it anywhere above ground? struck me as being very odd. So I turned to, to one of my mod yards uh, and said, uh, why don't you go down there and take a look? He refused. So I, I dumped my gear, got a 45 caliber pistol from my M79 guy. Uh, and uh, I put a, a grenade in one of my pockets and I used a flashlight that I had, a, you know, a, a pen light uh, and went down into the tunnel myself and crawled as far as I could get until there were, had been a cave in along, along that uh, tunnel 
I couldn't go any further. At that point, somebody yells down into, you know, from the bomb crater saying, we have enemy. So there's no way for me to turn around. So I have to back up, back up. And then I get to the, uh, to the crater opening. I get helped out in, in the, into the crater. The team is all inside the crater. Oh, you know, inside the rim of the crater. And the point man points to where uh, an enemy squad had crossed the road uh, a couple hundred meters away. Mm -hmm. Hang on for a second. Okay. I'm going to have to terminate this conversation pretty soon. That's fine. I was about to say we could actually break it up because uh, we've got yeah, a bunch we, of people. Yeah, it's just so we got to finish this one. So, okay. So uh, I guess be between the fact that I was a new one zero, this is my first mission, the fact that I had my guys walking on out in the open on the road in plain sight of, it, of anybody who wanted to take a pot shot at us, the fact that I had discovered uh, an underground uh, tunnel, and then, then the the uh, the point man said that he and and a couple of other mountaineers said they heard enemy movement in the vegetation on top of that hill, along you know in a in a uh, in, the, in a wood, wooded verge. So uh, we decided to, I, it had been alleged that you can knock down a tree with a Claymore mine. That's bullshit, unless it's a very small tree. Uh, there was a major tree that was, that it would not allow a CH-34 to pick us up from where that crater was. So I tried to use the the Claymore mine to see if that would, in between the the detonation of the explosive and uh, and the uh, and the fragmentation, the the pellets from the mine, what that would do to the tree. It barely knocked the bark off the tree. It was a big tree, granted, uh, and the mine yards still had heard you know movement in that area so i was saying well maybe it's not the enemy maybe it's some falling limbs because of the b-52 strike so the ch-34 pilot informed the covey that there was a another open space on top of the hill further up along the ridge just a short distance away between the open area where we were and across this swath of vegetation. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, so I, I directed the team uh, you know, to cross this isthmus of, uh, of vegetation. And my point man, who had been so savvy in, in, and saving our lives during the previous mission had been so savvy uh, by trying to distract the enemy. He panicked, and he started running like like crazy uh, to cross this isthmus to get to the other LZ, and left us behind. Uh, so we kept a you know a moderate pace and wound up rejoining with him where the where the cleared area was the ch-34 was able to somehow get in there and pick us up and as we were being uh, transported up one of the montyards a guy named ta who i mentioned to you before told me that we had just walked through the kill zone of an enemy ambush where an enemy squad 
had all their weapons pointed at, uh, at us as we crossed that isthmus. We were literally within 20 meters of them. And I said, why didn't you say something? His reason was because he was scared that if we started a firefight, they would finish the firefight because we were all in their sights. Anyway, when I got back to the FOB, I fired the point man who had run. And I and remember, I told you that uh, he had a brother on the team. So he his brother quit. So I had to select another point man and uh, and, and find another uh, team member beside him. Uh, so again, uh, the whole idea about doing a BDA in that manner was sound, but it scared the living shit out of my monyards. And they, th- they thought from that point forward, they thought I was nuts. They thought I was crazy. Uh, and uh, they loved John St. Martin because of his powerful build and because of his personality. They loved that guy. But me, they were scared. So uh, with that, uh, I think that'll be a a good one because not only we've got a few more missions, but we've also got a a bunch of photos that you can talk through because the viewers are still wanting to hear about your uh, RPDs, your setup and all that, that we have photos of. When do you want to do that? uh, We can do a part two of, Next week, uh, probably if you'd like to, uh, the same time uh, next week, we could do it, to be honest with you. Well, uh, I'm, uh, let's see, take a quick look here. That would be the 10th. Yeah, that's a possibility. Well, let's uh, talk about it. The 10th would be fine. I could pick up where I left off. Uh, and, uh, we could talk about the next Tango 7 mission, and then I can go into my rant again about, uh, the S2, the, uh, the Intel failures, uh, the failures of the Intel sessions, I should say, uh, because there's, there's, there's plenty more to talk about in that regard. In terms of this operation, and the uh, lessons learned. Uh, one lesson learned was the idea of landing on the beaten zone of the B-52 strike had merit. And I, had I gone on another B- BDA, uh, I would have done the same thing again. Uh, and uh, I also learned that I needed to get rid of uh, weak uh, team members who didn't have the, you know, the, uh, the fortitude to do as I, as I tell them. Uh, I, I was, I was a student of reconnaissance tactics, techniques, and procedures. Everything that I did, almost everything that I did was based on, a consideration of the pluses and minuses, the risks and benefits, uh, and uh, uh, when, when I would, I, I would enforce very strictly in real granularity TTPs that gave me an advantage against the enemy or gave us a better opportunity to survive. Uh, and, and that gave me the space, if you will, to take risks uh, that other team, team leaders wouldn't take. So for instance, walking on a trail was the Bible, according to the one zero school, and according to other one zeros, and I did it routinely because I understood that the enemy would not expect me 
to walk on roads and trails because it would be insane to do so. Yeah, so, so I did it and I got away with it uh, routinely. Uh, but it was always based on a consideration of, of the risks and benefits. Uh, and uh, sometimes I, I did some stupid stuff. But I always, when I went back to the to the FOB, went through my debriefing, and then went to bed at night, I would think about the operation that I had just been through, think about the errors that I'd done, uh, that, I, that I'd made, think about the things that I could do better, and I always implemented uh, corrective action. Uh, and it was a constant state of improvement uh, after every operation. I go to sleep thinking about those things. I would dream about those things. I wake up in the morning dreaming about those things. And then I would implement those in training. Okay. So uh, I, I think I have time to take one question or two. Uh, to be honest, we don't have any questions at the moment. We Everybody's been listening. <laughs> We've got 60 people in here that have just been glued and saying thank okay. you and all that. So I think the next one, people can get questions off of this to have ready and along with the photos that we'll be going through. Sounds good. All right. I'll be talking with you about setting up the next uh, podcast. I, I went ahead and keyed you down just preliminary for the 10th and we'll discuss further how we need to skin that cat so to speak super all right thanks all right. a lot bud. appreciate thank it. you for spending the day with us sir we appreciate yeah, bye -bye. you bye-bye